You are going to hear a conversation among Dr. Archer, Larry, and Judy, talking about the new term. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Okay, everybody. Welcome back to the new term. I hope you've all had a good break and that you're keen to start on your research project. What I'd like to do this morning is to give you a chance to ask questions about the project, requirements, ways of approach, how to get help if you need it. Today is informal. It may be already written on paper, but it's nice to have an opportunity to have it confirmed. So, any questions? Dr. Archer, is there a confirmed due date yet to hand it in? Yes, I can now confirm that it's 16th of July, not 15th, as first advised. Okay. And what about the word limit? Well, there is some flexibility on this, but in general, it's eight to ten thousand words. Ah, I see. And you can choose your topic, anything from years two and three. Yes. I still can't work out what I want to do it on. Who um. In that case, you should see your course tutor to agree on your final topic, and you should also be aware that there is special assistance available at the library on library resources if you need help on that. Can I just check on the deadlines for everything? Certainly. Look, let me write it on the board when each stage should be completed. First of all, you've got to work on your basic project outline, and that's due in to your course tutor by twenty-first of February. Which is only two weeks away, so you need to get cracking on that. Do we have to include a full reference list by then too? No, your reference list is due on sixth of April, which is one week later, so you have time to discuss this with your tutor. And when should we be doing the research? Well, that's over a one-month period, essentially April to May. And the write-up? Well. You need to do quite a bit of research before you get going on your writing, so that's really May to July, with a due date for handing in on the sixteenth. Any more questions? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions seven to ten. Now listen and answer questions seven to ten. Well, sir, just some advice, really. It's about the research approach. Would you advise us to use some case studies? Well, Larry, I know these can be difficult to arrange sometimes, but I really feel they are of great benefit in this subject. You can always talk to your tutor if you're having difficulty. Yes. I've looked over some previous research projects that are in the library. Is that a good idea, sir? I heard. Okay. I don't think you should go through them in detail, especially at this early stage, or you might end up being influenced by them more than you realize. But yes, it really is about the best guide you can have to what's required in the to what's expected in this type of project. Sorry, Judy. I butted in on you. That's all right. It's just that I noticed one project was a joint one. They worked together as a pair. Is that a good idea? Yes, I remember that paper. Working in a pair can have some advantages, but to be frank, this is meant to be an individual project, so it's best to work on your own. About using subjects, is it okay if we use family members? Your own relatives? I don't see why not. They probably offer some advantages in terms of availability. Although you need to guard against possible effects on your research outcomes, so you can if you want. Perhaps you should discuss this with your tutor if you plan to use relatives, so you can approach it in the best way. Okay, okay thanks. thanks. Okay then. Well, I hope we've been able to sort out a few things. You're welcome to see me at any time or drop me a note if you have any more queries. Fine. Fine thanks. thanks.
That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part two. You are going to hear an interviewer who is interviewing Alan. He made a great discovery of Mungo National Park. First, look at questions eleven to fifteen. As you listen to the first part of the interview, answer questions eleven to fifteen. An event occurred in 1996 over a period of three days that attracted considerable attention at the time, and led to a new find in Mungo National Park, which is the focal point of the Willandra Lakes World Heritage Area in New South Wales, Australia. I talked to Alan Moore, the organizer of this trip, about his experience. Alan. What was the purpose of your trip? Well, as you know, I love the outback and lead tours of people wanting to go into more remote parts of the country. However, I thought it was time for me too to have a holiday, so I packed up my family and we went to Mungo National Park. Why did you choose this location? It holds a record of Aboriginal life stretching back over forty thousand years, and of course, I wanted my young kids to be amazed by the main feature of the park. The remarkable walls of China, as they're called, where wind and water erosion have exposed this long history. I see. What was the weather like? It was unusual for that time of year. The rain was just one continual downpour after another. We were always soaked to the skin, so we decided to cut our holiday short and only stayed three days in the end. However, it was eventful. The obvious problem was to get back to the nearest town, a small place called Boronga. But the dirt roads out there are always impassable after rain, so we settled down for a long, wet wait in the park. We didn't really mind because the scenery was so interesting. However, the kids wandered away without our noticing, and eventually we realized they must be lost. So we used our two-way radio to contact the park rangers and the police, and a helicopter was sent. Luckily, the kids were found within a few hours, but they'd made an important discovery. Now look at questions sixteen to twenty. As the talk continues, answer questions sixteen to twenty. So the trip was also eventful for another reason, wasn't it? Yes, yes. They led us to some ancient Aboriginal art. The kids had taken shelter in a very small, low cave that was difficult to see from the outside. We were lucky to have another family camping in our location. When they heard us calling the kids, they immediately helped us search for them. And as the hours went by, they also provided us with much-needed support and encouragement. We really appreciated their help. And as we were already soaked through after looking for the kids for a couple of hours, they even made sure we had enough dry clothes to wear. The park ranger managed to get through to us to lead the search, and when the helicopter pilot notified us by two-way radio that he'd seen the children but was unable to land nearby, we were able to eventually find them very excited about what was in their little cave. And what did you think of their cave? Well, after squeezing in, I must say I was impressed. And managed to take a few photos of it before we left. There were many faint markings and dots on the wall. It was difficult to tell what they represented because they were so small. But people from the museum who have since visited there said the markings were similar to some other findings in the area, and later confirmed they were very old. Although it's now a protected site, the children like to call it their cave and are allowed to visit it when a ranger can go with them. Thank you, Alan. If you go to Mungo National Park. You can see the entrance to the cave, 
and some of Alan's photos at the ranger's station. Alan continues to lead tour groups in the outback, and if you want further information, That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between two students who will discuss a project they're working on together. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 21 to 27. Hey Jess, glad you could make it. We've got a lot to discuss. Hi Matt. Yes, sorry I'm a bit late. I did bring all my notes with me. Yes, me too. Where shall we start? Well, I think it would be a good idea to clarify our objectives just one more time. Yes, good idea. Okay, here we are. We need to record, photograph and identify the plant species in 10 one square meter plots. Does it say anything about where these plots should be and how they should be laid out? Ah, here it is. It says that all the plots need to be no more than 10 metres apart. And how do we choose them? Ah, this is the fun part. I remember this. Here we are. Make a one metre square frame using bamboo sticks available from the department stores. Yes, we've, we've already done that. I know, I'm just reading the whole section. Okay. One person stands roughly in the middle of the chosen area and throws the frame. The other person uses a tape to mark out the square where the frame landed and returns frame to thrower. The thrower then turns a few degrees on the spot and throws again. The thrower must turn slightly after each throw and vary the force of the throw until after the tenth throw they are pointing in almost the same direction as the first. That sounds a bit complicated. That's only because it's all in writing. It's just a simple throw, turn, throw, turn, throw, turn, until we have ten squares. And I guess you want to do the throwing. Well, if you don't mind. I'm sure you'll be more accurate at marking the squares. Yes, I am sure I am, and I'm sure you've got a stronger throwing arm. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 28 to 30. OK, good. We've got that sorted. Now we need to decide where to go. Yes, I've been thinking about that and I've brought the map. Ah, well done. I forgot mine. Now, I've identified three possible locations, but they've all got some disadvantages. OK, fire away. Well, the area around this lowland marsh could be interesting. There'll be a lot of interesting water plants here. Looks good, but what's the problem? Mainly that it's already a designated nature reserve, and I think there's already been a lot of research done here. Ah, uh, I see. Well, I'd rather do something that's new and can be useful. I agree. That's why I identified this area further west. See, here, behind the beach. 
Oh, yes, I see. That area there, where it's flat, but quite high. Exactly. If you look a bit further inland, you'll see that there are hills which will protect that area from strong north winds. I see. Excellent. But what's the problem? Just that it may not be very interesting. We know that the geology there is not conducive to a wide variety of plants. Mm, I agree. So, what's your last idea? Well, I think this one is a bit of a winner, although I did want to show you the other two. Look up here on the north coast. Where? See this bay? Well, I know that there's been quite a lot of studies done here, but a bit further to the east behind this headland. No one has ever looked at that. Well, I certainly couldn't see any studies. That is interesting. And the plant life could be a bit different because of the shelter from the wind the headland provides. Exactly. Brilliant, Jessica. That's a great idea. We'll go there. Thanks. Now all we have to decide is when is a good time. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You are going to hear the first part of a lecture on American culture and American customs. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Well, last week we talked about American education, and today I'm going to discuss American values, characteristics, personal habits and courtesies. Keep in mind as you are listening to this lecture that your goal is to understand, not to emulate or judge. Just briefly... I'd like to mention that there is a remarkable ethnic diversity in the United States. The population of the USA is about 260 million. 73% of the American population is white. 12% is African American. 8% Hispanic. 3% Asian or Pacific Islanders. And less than 1% American Indian or Eskimo. Many Americans resent generalizations being made about them because Americans see themselves as very unique and individualistic. On the other hand, Americans tend to lump foreigners together into one lot and condescendingly view foreigners as people who are not as intelligent or sensible as Americans. Despite Americans' dislike of generalizations and their ethnocentric point of view, it becomes evident that they are indeed American. Americans value individualism, independence, informality, directness, punctuality, achievement and competition. Individualism is probably the most highly esteemed value in the American culture and an important key to understanding American behaviour. In the historical development of the country, individuality was crucial for survival. If you asked Americans to characterise the ideal person, they would probably use adjectives such as autonomous, independent and self-reliant. Persons tend to be viewed as individuals rather than as representatives of a family or a group. Here are some examples of how this value affects behaviours. 1. If a group of friends go to a restaurant, 
everyone wants to pay their own way. In other words, they want to have separate checks and not be someone's guest. Two, in friendships which seem to initially develop more quickly in the U.S. than in other cultures, the Americans may feel uncomfortable if you give them more help than they need. This is a tendency to draw back and see dependency as weakness. In some ways, the stress on the individual rather than the family or group has led to a more informal society. Sometimes this lack of formality is viewed by members of other cultures as a sign of lack of respect. But that is not the intention in the American value system. This informality is even more predominant on the university campus than in other segments of society. Some ways in which you might see this value expressed in behaviours are 1. You will generally be on a first-name basis with other students in spite of any age differences. 2. Dress is very informal on campus. 3. Language is informal and sometimes confusing. Phrases like, see you later, and drop by any time, are not meant literally. They are informal ways of saying goodbye. Americans are direct. Honesty and frankness are more important to Americans than saving face. They may bring up impolite conversation topics which you may find embarrassing, too controversial or even offensive. Americans are quick to get to the point and do not spend much time on formal social amenities. This directness encourages Americans to talk over disagreements and to try to patch up misunderstandings themselves rather than ask a third party to mediate disputes. It is particularly interesting to see what behaviours have culturally become associated with straightforwardness. 1. A firm handshake somehow has come to be interpreted as a sign of sincerity. 2. Looking at a person when you speak to him or her gives an indication of honesty. 3. In a question of honesty versus politeness, honesty wins. It is considered better to refuse graciously than to accept an invitation and not go. 4. You will be taken at your word. If you refuse food the first time it is offered, to be polite, it may not be offered again. An American will not know that your initial refusal is politeness. Great value is attached to time in the US. Punctuality is considered an important attribute. As with all values, there are different rules of acceptability in different cultures. In the US, you should be present for school or business appointments at the exact time agreed upon. In social appointments, you can arrive 10 to 15 minutes after the agreed upon time, without giving offence. If you are invited somewhere for dinner and are more than 15 minutes late, you will need to offer an apology and an explanation. A phone call explaining you have been detained and will be late will save face for you and patience for the other person. Americans also value achievement and competition. The American style of friendly joking or banter, of getting the last word in, and the quick and witty reply, are subtle forms of competition. Although such behaviour is natural to Americans, you may find it overbearing or disagreeable. Americans are obsessed with records of achievement in sports, and sports awards are often displayed in their homes. Also, sometimes books and movies are judged not so much on quality, but on how many copies are sold, or on how many dollars of profit are realised. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.